Good morning once again. As we begin the second session, I would like just to, uh, to, to give you some uh, announcements. And uh, one of the particular announcements we want to make is that uh, if you have any questions, please uh, you can uh, write them on the Facebook platform and then also on the, uh, there is a number which I, oh, unfortunately, can somebody bring a number for me from, from there? Um, there's a number which we, we will give you. Uh, it's, it's protruding, just protruding there. There's a piece of paper. Yeah. And uh, so this is the number you can use to write an SMS of questions which will be attended to after lunch this afternoon. And so the number that you should uh, use to send the questions as an SMS is 0977. Five nine one five one five. That is zero nine seven seven fifty nine fifteen fifteen. So we hope that uh, as you we continue with the session, you can jot down the questions and send them in, and later on they will be attended to. So let's just commit the second session to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father and our God, we give thanks to you for what you have challenged us in the first session. We plead for your mercy that those words that have come to us by the power of your Spirit, they will move us and motivate us to be active and be involved in the work which you have left us. And now we commit our brother to you again for this second session. We pray and ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you. It's a privilege to come again to uh, continue in our consideration. And uh, in this second session, uh, I would ask us to turn to another passage of Scripture. It's in the New Testament, and uh, it's... Peter's second epistle, second Peter and chapter two. Let's just turn to that passage. Um, <clears throat> second Peter and chapter two. And the Bible reads, again I'm using the older new international version uh, of the Bible, and I read from verse one. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who, brought, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them down, sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood to on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men. For that righteous man, living among them day, by, day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, 
Then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. Let's turn to another passage, although our, in, our thoughts will still be on that second passage, on Second Peter, uh, but let's read Jude. Jude is a small book just before the book of Revelation, uh, and I'll read from Jude 3. Dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write to urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose destruction, whose condemnation, sorry, I'll read verse 4 again. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license of immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Though he, you already know, know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains, for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves to, up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, slander celestial beings, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses and did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against what they do not understand and what, and what things they do not understand by, sorry, and what things they do understand by instinct like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you and without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves, they are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. Autumn trees, without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, forming up their shame. Wandering stars, for, whose, for whom blackest darkness has been reserved. Let's go back to Second Peter, uh, that passage that we are going to consider as we come this um, uh, part of this morning and uh, probably the afternoon, uh, we are looking at um, the second part. Remember, at the beginning, I did promise that we will come and now in the second part to deal with uh, another part. Uh, how should the church respond to uh, in the midst of uh, you know, heresies that are going on around, wrong teachings, things that ought not to be among us. Uh, in other words, the church of Jesus Christ is in the world, but not of the world. The church of Jesus Christ is not only a, a structure or a building per se, and that's our common understanding, but the church is people. It's those who have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, and those that meet together and covenant to meet and worship Jesus Christ. That's what I mean when I say the church of Jesus Christ. So the church of Jesus Christ is working 
in, in the wilderness, if you like. It is in a place where they are bringing out the light of the gospel. They're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet, as they do that, Satan is at work. He's planting weeds among the, the, the wheat, as it were. He is busy bringing about uh, things that would undermine the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is busy confusing the, the children of God. Some of them almost led astray. But thankfully, they are the elect, and God will preserve his own. But in these times in which we live as the church of Christ, we live in increasingly difficult times. That's what I would say. Uh, we live in what I would call perilous times. That's a, an older word there. Perilous, difficult, uh, dangerous times, if you, if you like. We, our times, our Lord is cast into perilous times in many ways. There was a time when we, what we knew as Christian people, every other Christian, most likely would know, at least the fundamentals of the Christian faith. But that may not be the case now. And even those that are children of God, those that have been saved by the grace of God, without knowing, unawares, they will have taken in poisonous uh, doctrines and imbibed them as their own. For instance, one heresy that is there is, is known as Sabellanism. Okay, Sabellanism, that's a big term. Don't worry about it. But Sabellanism is a teaching which is, comes like this, that in the Old Testament, God came across as the Father. In other words, God is one, but he, he, he is called the Father in, in the Old Testament. And then in the gospel times when Jesus, uh, you know, is alive, God changes form and, and he becomes the son. So God is the son. And then after Matthew 28 or perhaps in Acts 1, he changes and he comes as the Holy Spirit. So they're saying, look, uh, God has been changing uh, and, 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 you know, he manifests himself in different ways. Well, friends, that might seem like an innocent teaching, but that's a heresy. And I've heard Christian people, fine Christian people, talk about God in those terms. Okay? So that's monism. Some other call it monism. So we live in very difficult times. But further, not only are there heresies that are flying around, not only are there errors that are flowing around, but these errors are being tolerated. There was a time when error, the slightest error, made its appearance. The church of Jesus Christ was alive and it would rebut that heresy and would deal with it with finality. Well, times are different. People say, well, we have different opinions, you know, about these matters. Let's not be dogmatic. Let's not be, you know, let's not take things so serious in, in, in our own language. We say, also, also we tenga personal. You know, we have sender personal. But no, no, it's, it's just an opinion. So errors and heresies and even cultic practices are taking root in the church of Jesus Christ. Sadly so. But there are perilous times in the third place because the traditional boundaries that we have known as Christian people have been busted. In other words, we, we, we knew this is right, this is wrong, this is what the Bible says, the Bible does not say this. Instinctively, we could tell and repel. Well, we live in times where the way we defined church, the way we understood church is very different. The church of Jesus Christ is morphed or it has changed. Uh, and, and, and the voices that are speaking into the lives of our people who are Christian people are more than just us meeting them maybe once a week or twice a week. They have so many voices that are listening to. So the boundaries have been busted. 
And may I say further that we see also that uh, increasingly cyberspace, and that's another aspect I will talk about, has become very, very strong. I, I teach in a university, and uh, one time I, 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 I got this class that I began to teach, and some student asked me a question. Uh, and uh, I noticed as I was talking, he was looking at something on his phone. And I said, ah, but are you not uh, listening? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm listening. I'm just checking that uh, what you're saying ties in with what I have read. Well, we have Uncle Gugu now, isn't it? Uncle Gugu is there <laughs> to instruct and to teach. So the voices that are speaking into the lies of the children of God, and may I say, even those that are outside are more than one. They're not few. They're thousands. They're millions, perhaps. Everywhere, things are being taught. But in the fourth place, there are perilous times. Because in the absence of truth, Error takes precedence. And error can go into heresy and perhaps even cults. So because truth is not in the public domain, because truth as it is in Scripture is not taken as it ought to be, guess what? The devil has thrown him his seeds. And so error and heresy is now having what is known as a resurgence. The cults, the errors and heresies are so many. And in fact, research shows that there are so many cults that are coming up every now and again that it is literally difficult and impossible to keep a tab on each and every one of them because there are so many. But why is that so? Why are they flourishing? Why are they so powerful and potent and even capturing even our very little children at a young age? How and why? It is because truth is not in the public space. So friends, for those four or five reasons, I would like to believe that we live in perilous times. There could be other reasons that we uh, we can, we can, and, and that's why it's, it's very important for the church of Jesus Christ to respond. Remember the command that Jesus gave? We must never forget. Go! 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 Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must tell the world of a salvation that is in God, the only way to be saved, that is in Jesus Christ. The Christian church must respond. Let's come back to Second Peter, uh, uh, just to remind ourselves. Second Peter there. Uh, and, and Peter is writing to these people. Uh, probably they're scattered all over the world. They seem to have been a persecuted lot. But he, is, he knows that his, his, his death is imminent. He's about to die. And he knows that he's going to be uh, you know, gathered to, to, to his fathers. Notice what he says in 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, and, and the same book, chapter 3 and verse 1. Look, notice what he says. Uh, Dear friends, this is my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders. To stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets. And the command given by our Lord Jesus Christ. And Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand. And then he continues to talk about the heresies that are going to happen. So he knows that soon he is going to be gathered to his fathers. And after he dies. Heresies perhaps were already taking place, but they were going to proliferate. In other words, they were going to increase exponentially. And we know from history that Peter himself was crucified. 
but he was crucified upside down because he says, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. So you need to crucify me, yes, but in a different way. So he was crucified upside down. But Peter is aware that soon he's going to die. And, and he says, look, we need to document these things. The church of Jesus Christ needs a permanent record that they might be able to remember deep into the future, long after we are gone, long after we are gathered to our fathers. They will always remember and walk in the ways of the Lord. But of course, Peter died. John was the last of the apostles. Uh, and of course, he writes uh, those uh, three epistles, short ones. The first one is a bit long, but the other two are short. And then he writes Revelation, about AD 95, somewhere there. And soon... John died a natural death. He was, of all the apostles, he's the only one, perhaps, who died a natural death. The others died in different ways. Apostle Thomas went to India on a mission trip to share the gospel, and there he was murdered, and he died. And the other apostles went to different places. I think it's Andrew who came to Ethiopia. I'm not so sure. But they went to different places, all because they were persuaded that the gospel and only the gospel was the only thing that could save the world. But yet they were very, very particular to preach and to teach that which was right. But in Second Peter chapter 2, uh, he, he brings out this aspect, which I think was echoed in Jude, that, you know, in the past they had false prophets, but you're going to have them even more into the future. And Jesus warned about this, and uh, before Jesus was there, there were false people who perhaps were among the people of God and just deviated or just arose from nowhere, and then they began to share and say certain things. Notice what he says. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. What is Peter saying? Is that false teachers are a given. In other words, whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not, they'll be there. They will be there among you. And how will they operate? Notice what he says. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Now, it, from here, I would assume maybe these people were among the Christian people perhaps, but these people begin to deviate. They are not only in error, which is a slight mistake or misunderstanding, of scripture, it does not, you know, go against the major truth of scripture. It's an error. So, in a sense, you may understand when somebody is in error. But here he is talking about heresies. Now, heresy is a very strong term. If somebody comes to you and calls you you heretic, ah, I think you should be you should be very very worried. In a sense, he's saying probably you are not a Christian. If somebody says you're in error, you can say, ah, oh, yeah, okay, none of us is perfect. Sometimes we, we, we may, although it's not good to be in error. But when he talks about heresy, he is talking about somebody who has fundamentally departed from the truth. In other words, they have repudiated, they have refused, they have vomited, they have not accepted anything that has to do with Christ. Perhaps at one time they walked among us. But there comes a time when they vomit everything and say nothing to do with Christ. I will not follow this Christ. Or they may not overtly come out, but they will come in a very subtle way. That's what, that's what he says here. He says they will secretly, secretly introduce destructive heresies. Now, the word here translated secretly, it means they will be very, very incipient. You know, slowly 
Just a little poison, you know, injecting it into your system, bit by bit. But they are also slippery. They have no handles. You can't touch them. They have a nebula structure. In other words, you cannot fully define them. They will come and secretly, they come in like a snake. They slither among you. You are sleeping and you are asleep and the snake just comes into your blanket and even is resting against your body. In the night, maybe you don't even have a, a, a lamp. Or oh, Zesco has gone. Is it Zesco which goes or is it Zesco's power? I'm not so sure. <laughs> but there's no power. And this snake comes and sleeps or next to you. And before you wake up, it even goes away. Unawares. Maybe you just see the evidences after it has gone. You see maybe some scales. <laughs> There was a snake here. <laughs> they, they secretly, they're very, very well trained. They are skilled. They are careful. They scheme. They plan. They are meticulous. They are well informed. They know how to do something. And they know exactly what they want to do. In other words, the agenda is very clear. Very clear. They know their objectives. They know what they want to get. They, they even have a time frame. They even have a strategy. They are going ahead to implement what they want to do. And so Peter is saying, they will secretly introduce destructive Heresies. Notice he's not saying errors. They're introducing heresies. In Acts 20, we read earlier in an earlier session when Paul is talking to the elders at Ephesus, he tells them that even from among you, although we see, you seem to be united, even from among you, men who rise up to bring about not only discord, but destructive things. But there will also be heresies from outside. So these, as far as Peter is concerned, they, uh, notice what they, we, they teach, the content of what they teach. He summarizes it very well. That Remember I said the heresy is a fundamental departure, and, and, and it, it's refusing the the core doctrines, in other words, the doctrines that define who a Christian is. Notice what they say, what he says. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bring, uh, who, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Now, what is it that they will teach? Many will follow their own shameful ways and will bring uh, and who bring the way of truth into disrepute. Notice what they're saying. They, they, they bring shame. They, they make the message of, of God unattractive. They, they, they paint it colors in ways that it is not accepted. When you're preaching that Jesus is the only way that you must be saved, they will say to you, that is hate speech. That is distract. Uh, no, that is dangerous. In other words, you are being discriminatory. How can you say Jesus is the only savior? There are many other saviors out there. In, in, in Baha'i, Baha'u'llah, in Islam, you know, and, 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 and so on. There are so many other ways to get to heaven. They may not sometimes even directly attack the Christian faith. They just say, let's be tolerant. Let's tolerate diverse opinions, even on the fundamentals. They will make the truth, they will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Of course, he's talking about the way of truth. Maybe it's a way of life, but I would like to believe also he's talking about the doctrine itself. Now, how, how does it show up in their practice, in their lives? Verse 3, in their greed, 
These men will exploit you with stories they have made up. Especially in our context. You know, in Africa, we are an oral tradition, eh? And we learn more by stories. You know, as you are talking stories, Tushimi, you know, under the insaka, the eye is well trained. They will pick all the details and be able to retell them orally to the next generation. Perhaps this was an oral tradition. But here, they come with stories that are so moving, spectacular, interesting. They're animistic stories, perhaps. They tell you about the spirit world. They tell you how that, uh, you know, omens will fall upon you if you do not appease the spirits. They will tell you how that the spirits of the dead are watching over you and they will react. Well, they may not tell you animistic stories. They will tell you other stories, which sound even scientific when they're actually scientism, not science itself. Uh, there's a difference between actual science and scientism. So, so, so there's a way in which these guys will come and bring philosophies and stories which sound very fine sounding. And yet those uh, have nothing to do uh, with what is true. And so he says they, they will, in their greed, they will exploit you with stories they have made up. There's, there's so much we can say there. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. And then, of course, Jude talks about uh, many, many other things to do with uh, the, the, the things that these people teach. So, friends, in perilous times, they are very, very dangerous times. And I'm not here to sound like an alarmist or a conspiracy theorist. No, that's not what I'm here for. But I'm speaking in the spirit of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5, where he talks about the days are evil. The days are evil, friends. Not only for the outsiders, but even for the Christian people. Why? Because we have heresies, error, Cults and those that would teach things that are against God. So what are the issues that are before us? And I'd like to say to you that I will not go into specific cults to mention because there are so many of them. Uh, we don't even have the time. Uh, what I've done to cover that, I've sent some papers to our brother Sangandu uh, to his email box. I don't think he's away. But you can get those. I tried to print them, but I couldn't manage he can send those to you. I've dealt with specific cults and to some extent some errors. But what are the issues before us? I'll just deal with the general principles and then we can talk about them uh, at another time. We live in times when heresy is acceptable. There was a time when error and heresy did not find room among us. But we also live in times where error is not as terrible as we once looked at it. At one time, if error showed up, it's like one of these eyelashes, is it eyelashes or gets into your eye? What are you going to do? Are you going to ignore it? No, you stop everything to make sure that your eye becomes clear again. Sometimes it might even mean washing your eye. Until that eyelash, or is it eye, whatever they call it, those my eye, my hairs at your eyes, until it comes out. Our toleration level was minimal towards heresy. But we also have, we live in times when alternative belief systems are acceptable. Well, for you, that's true. For me, no, excuse me, give me some space. One man's meat is an, another man's poison. That's what it is. And, and we even have people like that, reasoning like that, in the church. They say, well, excuse me, preacher, don't impose your opinion. Don't say this is right and this is wrong. 
Leave me to make a choice. Leave me to make my own opinion. It is my life. It is my choice. I can do as I please. Alternative belief systems. By belief systems, of course, we are talking about uh, Africa traditional religion. And even among us, we have belief systems that are not consistent with Scripture. Perhaps our system is syncretic. We mix with other things. But because we live in relative times, it's okay to believe in many things. But we also live in, in an age when people reject the authority of Scripture. They reject the inspiration. They reject the revelation of God's Word. And therefore, they say the Bible is only a guide. The Bible is not inspired. The Bible has errors. The Bible is not entirely trustworthy. The Bible was written by men. The Bible gives us an idea of how to live. But it is not an authority. It is not authoritative. I cannot submit to every and each of its dictates. Who is the Lord? That I may obey him, they'll say. The Bible is for Jewish people. It is not for us. We have people who reject biblical inspiration, revelation, and authority. Some of them are known as neo-orthodox. They are not orthodox, but neo-orthodox. They say, you know, the Bible becomes inspired when, you know, you're reading the scripture and then a verse jumps out and yeah, it becomes, that's at that point that it becomes inspired. But otherwise, this is just the writings of men. And I must say, not only are the people in the pew rejecting the authority of scripture, but even men and women who work in seminaries, in Bible schools, they are teaching things that are against Scripture. They deny the, 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 the authenticity of God's Word. They deny that, for example, the, the book of Genesis, the first 11 chapters are real and actual. They say, no, those are fairy tales. They cannot be true. Adam and Eve did not exist. They're just imaginary characters. Oh, friends, do you know what that means? It overthrows the creation story. It overthrows the origin of everything that is. But it overthrows and denies and rejects original sin and everything else upon which the scripture is built. So what it means is that if the foundation has been thrown out, and everything that we have believed is a lie. And even Christ himself must have been mistaken. Because he talks, he quotes from Genesis. He quotes from the Old Testament. And when Jesus is talking, usually he was, he was, he was using what is known as the Septuagint. That's the, you know, the Greek version of the scriptures. And he's quoting. And when he's quoting, he is saying, this is scripture. Jude, when he is writing, and even Peter himself refers to the flood. He refers to Noah. He refers to the Old Testament. Men and women reject scripture. They might talk about it. They might say nice things. They might sound good and, and gracious perhaps and good among us and philanthropic. They do good things. But in reality, they reject scripture. But the other issue as I've mentioned in an 
I don't know if it's an earlier past events uh, time when I talked about the tradi- or, it's, or it was during the introduction, the traditional boundaries of our church or church life, or would I say the gospel, the way that we used to do mission has changed. The context in which we are doing things has changed. Today people are saying, ah, we can do church virtually. We don't need to meet with other believers. We can do everything at home. Well, times like this are exceptions. Granted, we can use them. But this is not the norm, brethren. This is not the norm. Brethren, Christian people ought to be together in the local assembly and yet at the same time send out the gospel. So in other words, Christian people must belong. They must have a place they call home. Well, those are some of the issues that are before us. So as we are doing missions, we must be mindful that the dynamics have changed and they continue to change and we must be able to respond. What are the difficulties before us? Peter is talking to these people and he's telling them that these men, false prophets, profita, these men who went about and started teaching wrong and destructive heresies were people probably who had been respected in those churches. These men, and perhaps even women, were those who spoke with authority because they spoke the very words of God. They brought God's word and make it, made it known to the people. Well, we find ourselves in an increasingly globalized world. Cultures, boundaries, countries, whatever it is that we have, they are changing every day. And with globalization comes many, many things. Now, friends, the the difficulty we have, those things that I mentioned earlier on, is because of postmodernism. Postmodernism really is it's, it's an area or an era that is after the modern era. So in other words, let me put it this way. Modernism is a time between, uh, I think, 16th up to maybe 1989, somewhere there. That's what somebody calls it. It's a time where they knew what was right and wrong. In other words, they, they, they were very clear in their boundaries. They, they, they were very defined about what was right or wrong, good or not, this, that, and the other. That's a modern era. And the modern era insisted on empirical evidence. In other words, they said, for something to be true, we must test it and we must show that this is right or this is wrong. This is true or this is not true. The modern era. That explains why you and I, who are a bit older, find it difficult when we are dealing with the younger people generation. You, you say to them, ah, my son or my child, this is wrong. They'll say, ah, where are you coming from? Excuse me. Who, who is telling the other that that is right and wrong? Because in their mind, they've drunk in what is known as postmodernism. So after 1989 uh, and, and so on, there's an era what is called post Modernism, in other words, is after the modern era. And in postmodernism, what is there is that everything becomes relative. In other words, absolutes are abhorred. We don't want things that are dogmatic. We don't want things that are definite. We just leave it loose. The boundaries must be removed. We are the ones to make decisions. Truth must be constructed by us. We are the ones who are in the driving seat. We are the ones who are to decide what is true or not. Not God's word. So friends, postmodernism is upon us. It has permeated to all areas of society. In our schools, 
in our homes, in our churches, everywhere. So as we are going to preach the gospel, we will encounter people who are postmodern in their thinking. And they will say, no. Who says Jesus is the only Savior? No. Who says that if I don't believe in Jesus Christ, I'll die eternally? No. Who says that when my body ceases to function, that I will go to hell? No. I am the one who makes a decision. And you know what? This kind of relative thinking has seeped into the church. And now we are beginning to debate things that were obvious yesterday. One example is homosexuality. Hey, that's a very touchy subject in some countries, isn't it? A few days ago, I wrote a paper and I submitted it and I attacked some of those things to do with homosexuality. And the, the person says, ah, I can't publish that. I understood. Why? Postmodernism. The church is under attack. And you know, postmodernism is a way of thinking and reasoning. So when somebody comes and uproots the way that you think, the foundation of your thought, they plant in another processor, if you may call it in computer terms. In other words, they put in a software which you, you were not aware. Maybe the, the other data is still the same, but the processor down there is different. And you begin to operate in a different way. Do not, uh, uh, you may not even be aware, rather, that things have changed. And that's what postmodernism has done. And you know what postmodernism has done? It has kicked out Christian thinking, the Judeo Christian worldview. And it has implanted what is known as nat naturalistic or human kind of thinking. So, postmodernism is upon us. That's one of the difficulties we have. Another one is what is known as pluralism. Now, I'm using terms here uh, which you may need to. By pluralism, I'm simply saying that in a context, in a globalized world, uh, because many cultures are interacting, suddenly you realize, ah, you know, wearing tropicals to the office for me, it's normal. And I don't know if you can call it topic, but 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 it's a brand name. You know, some slippers and so on. I, I, I wear them to the office and it's normal, it's accepted. But in another country and another context, it's frowned upon and you say, ah, what is going on? So pluralism really is teaching that they are more than one truth. And in religion, Christianity is not the only way to be saved. Christ is not the only savior. There are many other saviors. There are many ways to go to the Father. In other words, there are many ways to go to the mountaintop. But not only is, are we contending with pluralism, we are contending with what is known as materialism. Materialism. By materialism, we mean placing so much emphasis on material things. And we think in material terms. We think and relate to each other and, you know, respect each other based on material things. What I have, what I have achieved, how far I have traveled, the things that I own. What is it that I may gain out of it? So materialism has invaded the church of Jesus Christ. There was a time when I got saved. Maybe I was just naive, but I never saw class issues becoming an issue. No, we would relate based on whether somebody is a Christian or not. That's all. These accomplishments, materials, they were secondary. But the time has changed. 
Is it what you have? What you own? How far you have gone? So materialism. Sometimes we may not even own those materials, but the way that we think. We just think in material terms. Then another one is that we are dealing with naturalism. They're connected, these naturalism. By naturalism is what I talked about earlier on. We're saying only the things that we can see, only the things that we can touch. If something cannot be sensed by the five senses, it doesn't exist. It is not there. And so they will argue that God does not exist. Why? Because we cannot put God in a test tube and we cannot find out and, 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 and prove that he exists. Therefore, because we cannot prove that he exists, therefore he doesn't exist because we cannot sense him. That is naturalism. And it is there among us. And it is the way the non-Christians think. But I would like to say, uh, as we go on, that is what is known as the New Age way of thinking, the New Age thought. New Age thought. Now, this, you can put it under cult, actually. It's a cult in itself. But New Age thinking simply uh, rides on a platform of uh, postmodernism, uh, and, and, and it's, it's a very complex kind of uh, thing, but it's a mixture of materialism. And, 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 you know, spiritualism, uh, spirituality rather, and, and, and all these other things. And he doesn't believe in a personal God, but he believes in the existence of some supreme being who is not knowable, but is there, and we need to connect in him. The New Age movement has come in a very, very powerful way, even in the Church of Jesus Christ. But then we also have to struggle with what is known as cyberspace. There was a time when we would talk to people and spend time to share the gospel. Now, many people spend most of their time in cyberspace. Any little time that they have, they are on the phone. They are on the internet. And if you want to catch some people, you have to be in cyberspace, isn't it? If you are BBC, born before computers, like some of us, you just get surprised. Ah, these young people and other people are just connecting and they are laughing. They even use, and you're wondering, what are the issues? <laughs> there is a whole world out there in cyberspace. And you know, friends, if we are going to capture people, we need to catch them there, partly. But I've talked about the abandonment of the Judeo-Christian worldview. The setting of everything from Christ to naturalism. But then we also have our own default worldview, African worldview. That's another thing we have to argue with. I remember in some, one of our faculty meetings we had, and we were talking about worldview. Uh, and then there was a statement that was passed that for the African, the Christianity is a mile wild, wide and an inch deep. I think my brother were together, eh? an inch deep. And the violent reactions that came, and I understood, the violent, he's like, you're saying we're not Christians. I said, ah, wait a minute. We're not saying you're not Christians. All we are saying is that there is a default world view which each and every one of us operates from. And how do you tell the default world view? When you have a crisis, there's a death in the family. Maybe one person dies today, another person dies next day. The other day, another person in the same family, you go, mm, somebody's playing on us. You know what I'm saying? They two left us all. What is it telling you? There is a system of belief that we have. But as a Christian person, when I become a Christian, Paul says, renew our minds, Romans 12. We must begin to remove that mindset and begin to infuse God's words. And our thinking must become biblical. So we have this default word. Jack talks about sharing the gospel to the African. 
that you must peel off some of those layers. Now, I don't know how true that is. But we need to contend with our own world view. And it's not only Africans who have issues. Even our friends from the West, for instance, they are materialistic. They are naturalistic. They are and have a worldview. Sometimes they say, oh, Africans are just superstitious. Eh? And we begin to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? With postmodernism, witchcraft, and all those other things are making their headway back into those contexts where the Christian faith had been very strong. A movie like Harry Potter, you know that that's just pure witchcraft. I know some of us love that one, but it's pure witchcraft. Cartoons that our children watch, some of those point away from the Christian faith. Ah, let me come closer. Those of us who love, who love what is that called? Uh, not Z World, but the, there's an Asian uh, set. You know that all they're teaching there is a Hindu worldview. That's all they're teaching there. You may not realize it, but that's what is happening. Well, I need to move on and say that we also have the cults to contend with. That's the other thing that we have. We have the cults to contend with. What is a cult? A cult is a group or entity that questions the fundamental teachings of the Christian faith or of any group in preference for a unique set of teachings. And usually a cult has a person or a group of persons or even teaching at the core, at the center. This person or this group of people, whoever they are, cannot be questioned. They have so much authority when they speak. What they say is gospel truth and it cannot be questioned. That's a cult. And you know, if you're a member of the cult, one of the things, one of the indicators is that if that significant person or whoever it is says something, you believe without questioning, without checking with scripture, whether it's right or wrong, you could be in a cult. It tells you this wall is black. But you are able to say, no, but it's white. But it tells you, no, this wall is black. <laughs> and you, because he has spoken, because she has spoken, you begin to say, it is black. That is a cult. What are the traits of a cult? Now, I'm just giving uh, some aspects. What are the traits of a cult? First of all, cults are missional. They know what they want. They will teach what they want. But secondly, cults are secretive. They have a secret set of truth which they want to communicate and they will not tell you everything you need to know until you are in the fold. But cults also are very subtle and inflexible. They are humanistic in nature. In other words, they respond to human needs. In other words, cults appear to be very caring and very kind, and very good. At first, you will not notice it. They will come to you and give you what you want to hear. They offer a solution you have never imagined. And they will be there for you until you get in. Before you realize it, you have entered into bondage. We have to contend with cults. And cults reject orthodoxy, like I said. They, they deny doctrines like the Trinity, the hypostatic nature of Jesus, the, you know, the two natures of Christ, the virgin birth, salvation, and, and many other uh, Christian doctrines that we... You know, friends, cults are very subtle. I remember many years in college, uh, 
when we were studying, we had this gentleman who joined our group. And when he came, we thought, ah, here is a brother who has come. Let us embrace him. It took a long time before we discovered he was not actually one of us. But you know what? He showed all the signs. But there were certain things that were un uncomfortable, that you, and then we just ignored them. But before we knew it, he had done a lot of damage. So they, they know what they want, and they come in secretly. And you know what he was doing? He was beginning to teach against the truth of Scripture. Teaching opposite things. Attacking the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we, we need to know that cows are there. But how do they operate? How do cows operate? They come in, they lure, they appear to have answers, they deceive, and after they have won your confidence, they capture you or initiate you so that you get into what is known as a bondage. And before you know it, since they have put the hook and it's locked to your neck, they just begin to pull. In other words, they begin to control and manipulate. But the other thing that you need to notice about cults is that they are very diligent at research. They find out the latest scientific evidences and use them to their end. So cults are so much a problem, not only outside, but even in the church of Jesus Christ. Well, friends, I must hurry on and make sure that they will introduce destructive heresies. There are certain ways that the church must respond, and these are the ones that I'm going to offer you quickly so that we must uh, be able to answer the question, how can we do missions in difficult times? Response number one, we must remember the command that Jesus gave in Matthew 28, Mark 16, and Acts 1. We must remember that this command is before us. We must go to all men, even to those who don't know the Savior, even to those who are in cults. We must go to share the gospel. Number two, we must know our enemy and the weapons that they use. If you're going to effectively combat heresy and error, you need to know their appeal. What is it that makes them attractive? But you must know also their approach and methods and strategies that they use. You must equally know what is it that makes them relevant, that makes them capture the attention of people. You know, one thing I've noticed about cults, they are very well financed and resourced. They have so much money. Money is not the issue. And they capture people very easily, especially those that are vulnerable. But we need to find out also their character. There's a character test we must find out and their worldview and philosophy. Number three, not only should you know who you're dealing with, but you must, as a church of Jesus Christ, or as a collection of churches, we must respond proactively. And what is this? We must train our people in Scripture. We must expose them to the body of divinity. We must be intentional brethren. We must spend time. We must teach our people. We must labor. We must spend everything that we have. If only they might know the truth and be established in Christ. Paul says, for three years, I labored. Friends, three years is not a short time. And he says, night and day, I toiled. We must train our people. 
So if we're going to do missions as churches, we must invest in the training of our people. And when I'm talking about training, I'm not only talking about going to a theological college or whatever it is. It is important if we can, why not? But the church itself, every Sunday, every Lord's Day, it is Sunday school. People must be trained, must be exposed to truth. We must bring the body of truth to bear upon our people. So that they are equipped to engage in apologetics, the defense of the Christian faith, and to carry on the mission of Christ. So what should we train them in? In scripture, primarily. But we must teach them also history, historical theology. I found that very, very helpful. Studying and knowing how God has dealt with his church over the years. So that when errors come, they will not look new because there's nothing new under the sun, the scripture says. So whatever looks new now, most likely it has been there in history. All you have to do is just go down the memory lane and you will be able to isolate and discover it. For instance, the charismatic movement looks like it's new. It's not new. It's always been there. In the second century, we had what is known as uh, Montanism. And then we had, you know, the Quakers and so on in the 18th century. So we have had pockets of this. It's only now that now it's just accepted. It's normal. We must train our people in Scripture. But secondly, I would like to say is that we must invest in research. We must spend time to find out what's going on if we're going to respond correctly and rightly. Now, I must be careful here because, uh, uh, you know, Christian people generally, we don't want to apply ourselves in intellectual matters or, you know, research. We say, no, that's worldly. Leave it for the other people. No, friends, I'm arguing. The Apostle Paul is one of the smartest minds that have ever lived. He, he, he knew what was going on in his day and he could quote from what was going on and he could apply what he, what he knew. Friends, we need to understand what was he doing in Athens in Acts 17 as he was walking around. He was doing some research and finding out uh, the, the idols that these guys worship. And so when he approaches them, he argues based on the facts that he had found. We must invest in research. But thirdly, we must connect. Having research, we must know how best to, record, to connect with those people that we want to touch. Remember I said, if the people are in cyberspace, go there. If the people are found at the markets, go there. If the people are found, you know, traveling around and so on. Find efforts to go there that you must share the gospel. First of all, you must be trained. You must research. But then you must connect as a church. But may I say further, is that we must consistently re-evaluate our strategies. In other words, that which worked 10 years ago may not work now. Those are strategies. I'm not talking about truth. The truth remains the same. But the way that we are going to catch these people and send the gospel, we must consistently be evaluating them. Let me qualify it also and saying further that we must evaluate it using scripture as a premise and our standard. I'm not talking about pragmatism here. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being ethical, being biblical, and yet being able to take the gospel to the next generation. Well, what is the other thing that we should do in response? Is that we must mobilize and respond. Having identified that this, the people that we are dealing with, 
perhaps think in a different way, the, 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 the foundation from which they are operating is different from ours, or they don't look at the Bible, they don't read the Bible, so when I'm preaching to them, I must know how to bring across the same truth. But the church must mobilize. Not only must we inoculate those people, our people, but we must galvanize our resources. We must get our resources together and send them in the right places so that God might be honored. For instance, if you're going to get university students, those want to be intellectual, you must spend in that direction. Perhaps it may mean if you're not doing it already, having a fellowship at the university, for example. Or it might mean going there for evangelism, going chatting, become friends, and so on. Using young people to talk to other young people, peers. Friends, what are we saying? To do all these things, we need resources. That's why the church must own this work. And when I'm talking about the church, I'm talking about the local church. You know, we have come to a time where I see our churches consistently talking about money from outside the country. It's good. It might help some. But friends, we are the ones who own this mission. And we must take it seriously. It's our work. The mandate is not to anybody else. It's us, friends. We must do everything. If you're going to build your house, for instance, every coin matters. You put it aside. You jealously guard it and make sure that you use it in the right places. What more for the king of kings? Now I know communal projects sometimes can be very, very controversial, isn't it? Very controversial. But if we have a shared vision and we understand what is at stake and what Christ has said and commanded, then our attitude will be different. But let me go further. Not only should we galvanize and in terms of mobilization and in response, not only should we inoculate our people, not only should we galvanize our resources, but we must practically send missionaries to the mission field. Now, here I'm using missionary in the traditional sense. Eh? Uh, sending a missionary, let's say, at Kapiri. And when you send that missionary at Kapiri, you must support this mission station. You must be there for the missionary. You must support and work with him so that he or she or the church at Kapiri will be able to plant other churches. We need to send missionaries. So missionary can be used in different senses. I, 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 I can suggest three. One of them is a traditional sense, the one I've just talked about. But there's also what you might call the modern sense. Or, you know, where each of us, wherever we are, God has sent us on a mission. As we work, as we labor away, you're a teacher, you're a lecturer, you are a soldier, you are a doctor, wherever God has placed us. We are doing missions. God has sent us to do his work, and we will do it. But the third arrangement, or third option I'd like to suggest, is what is known as a tent-making arrangement. You go to a place specifically to do something, but your main aim is missions. The Apostle Paul I think engaged in part of that. Acts 18, verse 1 to 3. You know, he, he was making tents. That's why the phrase tent making, eh? He, he was making tents with Priscilla and Aquila, but yet he was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second one that I talked about is, I call it the modern, Acts 11, verse 19, and so on. It talks about wherever God sends us, we will do the work of ministry. 
But friends, what I'm saying is that let's send missionaries to the local church, I mean to the local scenario, internationally, and so on. And in responding, another thing I would like to say is that we need to exploit the means that are there for us. I think that's important. We need to maximize. I was chatting with Pastor just now. I said, ah, I don't see you bringing sermons uh, uh, anymore to, you know, to our radio station. He just laughed and says, ah, I think there's a phrase he used. He says, I can live stream. <laughs> he said a lot in that statement. Friends, those things are there. Let's use what is there. Let's use it well. Let's use it to the glory of God. Let's be serious. Let's be direct. And let's advance the cause of Jesus Christ. Yes, I know there are abuses there. But we need to do the right thing. So what am I saying? Let's write. Let's preach. Let's teach. Let's broadcast. Let's use whatever means, including social media. Ah, that's difficult to say. Because it carries many immune connotations to it. But friends, that's where the people are. And if you're going to target them, if you're going to be intentional, you need to be where they are. So, how else can you do missions? I'm saying to, to us, let's use what is known as cyberspace. Let's go there. We need to open up sites. We need to have blogs. We need to have virtual magazines or is it uh, uh, journals and so on. Let's also enter into academia. Christian people, sometimes we are anti-intellectual. We don't want to apply ourselves. We don't want to be found among those who perhaps want to use their minds. But we need to be there. History tells us one of the most intelligent men that have lived on the earth is the Apostle Paul. He's one of them. Very educated, very sharp, and yet gospel-centered. Very potent, wherever he went. You know, he, if he's, he's in Athens, for example, with the Greeks, he begins to argue like a philosopher. If, he, if he's among the Jews, he opens the sacred pages. If he goes to this other, he had the ability to communicate. So, so how, how, how did he do that? He entered and applied himself into academia. So pastors, elders, Teachers, whoever we are, let's encourage our people to apply themselves in academia as well. But not only in academia, we must have our people in all other areas, in the skills, the trades. We need to have our people there. We need to have our people in the passport office. We need to have our people who are the plumbers. We need to have all sorts of people everywhere. And you know, some people will never come to our church. The closest they will have come to our church is how you and I live and what we say to them. We need to be intentional. Let's encourage also that our people engage in what is known as projects. What are those projects? They could be scientific projects. There could be works that will bring glory to God. It might be costly. It might cost money. But we need to be there. The church needs to keep its focus. But its members may be encouraged to go into other areas of this life. And they will do these projects that will bring glory to God. Some of these will be very costly. And at times, even cost their very lives. But we need 
to encourage them to do it. Well, friends, let me come to a close. Uh, but one more point and say that if we're going to preach in a postmodern context, we need to trust the Lord. In fact, this should have been the first. We need to pray, that's number one, but we need to trust the Lord. The apostle, with all that he had working for, going for him, would pray would ask the church, would cover the prayers of the saints. And he says, pray for us, brethren. Ephesians 6, verse 19. Pray for us. You know, in, in Ephesians 6, verse 10, put on the armor of God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, brethren, pray for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, stand firm because God is on our side. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. Pray! Pray for us that doors may be open for us, that the gospel may go and have increase. But our Lord himself says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send laborers. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Those who have put their hand to the plow, those who are ready to spend and be spent for Jesus Christ, they are few and far between. But pray, brethren, pray, Jesus tells his disciples, that God himself might raise men and women who give themselves to this way. But in Luke 18, verse 1 to 8, he talks about the unjust judge, that man who was not interested in anything. He didn't even believe in God. But this persistent widow kept on bugging him. And he says, although I don't fear God or man, but she will tire me out, so I'll give her justice. Not that we can twist the arm of God, no. But we need to pray, brethren, and to trust him. Jesus has said that I am with you to the very end of the age. What are the applications? Number one, we need to contend for the faith. Number two, we need to pray without ceasing till God establishes his work. Number three, we need to go out once again, not just sitting. Number four, we need to raise the next generation of seven leaders in all spheres of life. That's what CABU stands for, isn't it? Training the next generation in Africa for Great Commission living. Brethren, we need to spend and pour our lives into these young people. You and I, at least the people that I'm seeing here, we're not here for a very long time. Okay, I'm not wishing that we die, but we're aging. I have gray hair all over my chin these days, and I'm saying, you know, it's mobbed, and I'm saying, ah, ah what has happened? He's just telling us that we are growing, and we may not be here for a long time. But if we won't be here for a long time, this mission must continue. How are we going to do it? We must invest in the next generation. Yes. Intentionally. Spend time with them. Encourage them. Build them up. Lend them books. Expose them to missions. Long term and short term. We must make sure that we go out there through them. And they also in turn will train others. That's a biblical model. But number five, the church needs to own missions. So in case you're thinking, oh, somebody will do it for us, no. It's you and I to own it. But if somebody comes along to help us, we'll be grateful to God. But that is our baby. We need to own missions. 
We need to support those that are in the mission field. And we need to engender the philosophy and thinking of mission. It is high time that we went back to the basics. It is the main thing. And we need to do it. Brethren, we have no option. So if you have been listening to me today, if there's anything that you need to go away with, is that we need to share the gospel. Even in a poison environment, even in times when it seems not feasible, we need to find ways. And how we're going to do it? It is by equipping ourselves and be, then being able to send those things out. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent. We pray that you help us to apply ourselves in a way that is correct and to the glory of your name. We know that uh, not everything has been said and perhaps some things may have been said amiss. We pray that you would help your people to know what is true. Help us to be burdened again for the cause of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We thank God for the teaching that has come to us. So we will break off for lunch uh, for one hour, which means we will be back online or on air uh, about 14 hours. And so we have one hour lunch time, and then we'll be back. So just a reminder, those who have questions, please write them down and send them uh, through. You can use the Facebook platform. And, or you can use the uh, text message to this number, which I am going to uh, say to you, 0977-59-1515. I repeat, 0977-59-1515. So thank you. Be able to see you after lunch. God bless you.